Recast, your weekly dose of economic thinking from your friends at the Foundation for Economic Education. My name is Richard Lawrence, and I'm here today with our beautiful panel, Anna Jane Peril, Dan Sanchez, Marianne March, and returning special guest, T.K. Coleman. Welcome. Hello. You. you look thank radiant you. as ever, Richard. Oh, well, thank you, Anna Jane. It's, uh, <laughs> it takes a lot of work, but, you know, we end up here every week, and yeah. we, tr do we do what we can, you know? Um, so we're going to be talking about teachers today. We're going to be talking about mm -hmm. those important people, I think, who have made differences in many people's lives, including, I can at least speak for my own, my life. Uh, I had a great teacher. I had many great teachers, one of whom was my fifth grade teacher, Mrs. Conley, who, in fact, I just reconnected with on Facebook. And she went through a couple of my photos and, and started commenting and saying, you know, how great it was to she see went on, me. like, a like frenzy a to get your bit. attention. And, and, then, and then, you know, then other people started commenting on those photos again, too. Mm -hmm. So it kind of revived those photos as did she Facebook friend, tends to did she do. she friend you or did you friend her? I friended her. Oh, wow. So you yes. were out there looking for her. I was for oh. many, many years, many years. Wow. Her name is Betty Conley. And again, my fifth grade teacher, she taught me all sorts of things. In fact, she even gave me the chance to teach a computer club and a class to teachers and to students uh, after student school. becomes the teacher. Indeed. <laughs> it was one of those times in our collective history where computers were fairly new to the classroom. And so yeah. it was important for the 10-year-old uh, you know, to be able to teach the teachers how that would all work. But today we're going to be talking about something that I think we might be able to add some economic and ethical context to. And that is uh, a new series of stories that came out last week from Time Magazine and made a pretty big splash, actually. Uh, TK, you actually brought this to our attention. Uh, Teaching in America was the title of the series that Time Magazine had. Yeah, so it, it was a post by Katie, Katie Riley, and the headline says, I work three jobs and donate blood plasma to pay the bills. This is what it's like to be a teacher in America. And it's chock full of really interesting and provocative quotes, um, but there was a cover series that they ran and promoted on Twitter, and that's the part that really caught my attention. Lots of celebrities were sharing it. And there were three covers with teachers on them and quotes on the, on the cover, and I want to read those three for people to have Absolutely. some context. The first one says, My child and I share a bed in a small apartment. I spend $1,000 on supplies, and I've been laid off three times due to budget cuts. I'm a teacher in America. Mm -hmm. Cover two, I have a master's degree, 16 years of experience, work two extra jobs, and donate blood plasma to pay the bills. I am a teacher in America. Wow. Mm -hmm. Number three, I have 20 years of experience, but I can't afford to fix my car, see a doctor for headaches, or save for my child's future. I'm a teacher in America. And the post is pretty clear that teachers are people to actually give you another quote from Hope Brown of Kentucky. I love teaching, but we are not paid for the work that we do. And this is a common way that many teachers feel about themselves and that many people feel about public uh, school teachers and kind of wanted to bring this to the topic table for discussion. It is absolutely, I think, a really common narrative that teachers right. are uh, teachers are some of our most underpaid. I mean, we mm -hmm. perceive them as the most underpaid people, yeah, I mean, workers out there. Yeah. Well, it was That's just true. a couple of months ago that we all saw on the news the strikes that were happening in Oklahoma. That's right, and a couple other states as well, and they were striking mm -hmm. because, again, they believe uh, that they are underpaid. Yeah. And one thing that came up during the, when that, there was that wave of strikes and protests is that there's a lot of misinformation about that propagated by the media. So we have an article on fee.org called How Media Outlets Misinform the Public About Teacher Pay. And some of the things that they don't factor in, they don't, they don't um, adjust for the cost of living uh, of the di different states. Right, so, so between New York City yeah. and somewhere right. in Kentucky, there might be a very big, there is a very big difference in the cost of living. Exactly, and in particular, Oklahoma was, was in the headlines, and the cost of living is quite low in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. You were going to say something? Yeah, I did pull um, some numbers. So this year, the Oklahoma starting salary for a teacher with a bachelor's degree and zero years of experience is 36600 And just to give a little context, according to pay scale, the average Oklahoma salary this year is 48000 So about 12000 12, underneath the the average for t starting out teachers but i was uh, i was a little surprised i thought given all of the all of the news and the strikes i was expecting a much lower wage when i was working full time in retail i think i was earning roughly $25,000 a year and so um, i was surprised that it was as high as 36 to be honest one line mm -hmm. that we have in the article i mentioned is adjusted for costs of living 
the average annualized immediate compensation of Oklahoma teachers in 2016 to 17 was about $102,943, or wow. roughly twice what CNN had said a teacher with a doctorate degree and 30 years experience will never make in most districts. Because it's Oklahoma. extremely affordable to live where these, where these, I right. guess, salaries are being pulled. Yeah. Right. And I mean, yeah. Another thing is that they, they often don't include benefits. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. exactly right. Which and you've got retirement, yeah, you've got gigantic, crazy retirement yeah. benefits, you've got, yeah. Well, and it's interesting, too, because, again, I feel like this Time Magazine piece actually sort of compresses the data in a way that isn't all that useful for us, right? So they tell us that there are 3.2 million K-12 through full-time teachers in the country. All right. Uh, that's, that's a number, a big number. <laughs> but then average how many, nationwide how many salary, 3.2 million okay, full-time yeah, K-12. through About half New York City. Yeah. yeah. I know that much. Um, average nationwide sa salary, which is, I think, a bit interesting to unpack is fifty nine thousand mm -hmm. dollars and like you said that doesn't include the pension mm -hmm. benefits it doesn't include other sorts of benefits it doesn't include the fact that they take a summer off it's another mm -hmm. big thing yeah one line that we have is that an average of 37 percent uh more hours are worked by private industry employers per year than teachers right yeah. right so we're throwing out a lot of numbers and i think that none of us here would begrudge teachers or anybody for that matter for trying to get trying to get their money trying to mm -hmm get increases in salary. Yeah. So I think that's totally understandable. We all want to feel like we're being compensated and compensated fairly for the work that we're doing. But yeah. how is the big question? Yeah. Uh, because like, do you do it through coercion or do you mm -hmm. do it through market negotiation? And mm -hmm. you could argue that especially public school teachers that they're, they're not asking uh, customers or, or even private employers to ju just pay more. They're asking, they're not asking, they're demanding that taxpayer uh, money be forcibly transferred to them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and the sentiment that you're saying there, uh, Marianne, is echoed in the article. Hope uh, Brown from Kentucky, who you mentioned, TK, says in the piece, I do want to be paid what I'm worth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I was going to say, I mean, I think that it's a very understandable thing to say, well, well, we all should value education a lot. We right. should be paying these people mm -hmm. tons. But what you're kind of mm -hmm. saying, Dan, is that you have to think about how we how we end up accounting for that value? Is it going to be kind of like governmental coercion or choice? Right. And then you might wonder, okay, in a market, in an actual market for, for their labor, would they actually be paid higher? Because if they are offering a, um, a lot of value. But a big part of value is not just uh, the, the good that um, humanity as a whole gets from this, mm -hmm. but the availability of it. I mean, it, it's just supply. go... It just goes back to the uh, the alleged diamond water paradox right. that uh, uh, that Adam Smith raised, um, and and then this notion that okay, well, why should diamonds be worth more than a, a diamond be worth more than a bottle of water when a bottle of water is what we need to live? Like in the same way as education, it's like everyone needs education to to become like a good a, a good person, but. Again, there's a lot of water, and there's not very many diamonds, and and it's all about like um, the, so you have to consider the supply, and there are a lot of pe people who are able and and willing to offer teaching services uh, a lot fewer than are are able to offer doctor services, mm -hmm. or, uh, which is often the example that people bring up. Whether the they do it, whether they do it well is another question entirely yes. and that goes into all sorts of rules surrounding tenure mm -hmm. and teachers unions for employment and, and termination. All that would go into, you know, whether you actually have good service delivery by these mm -hmm. teachers. But you said something a moment ago, Dan, that I do want to delve into and it kind of leads into the next topic that we want to discuss here. And Hope Brown, again, the teacher who's mainly profiled in this piece in Time magazine, says that if budget cuts continue, all right, so we'll just pause and have that integrate into our consciousness for a second. Uh, if budget cuts continue, teaching will cease to be a viable career mm -hmm. for educated, engaged, ambitious people. And I think that's an interesting statement because I believe truly when someone is called to educate that they feel that it is not just a job. It's a calling, right? Yeah. I mean, they feel in many ways that this is something they can do to add value and inspire children from a very early age. It's a valuable thing. But I feel like the direction of this piece, especially with the emphasis on budget cuts continuing, is that there's been something happening in the state funding you were saying it might be compulsory, and, and we can discuss that as well. There's something happening that is, uh, you know, decreasing the amount of resources available for this, uh, 
profession that is necessary. The question is whether we actually need the state to be involved in it. Hmm. So budget cuts continue. Is that something that it looks like there's uh, actual, is it happening in education? Well, um, so in some of the research I did, I found that adjusted for inflation, teachers um, across the U.S. have seen an average decrease of $27 from 1996 to 2017. So I think there there is an argument to be made by them that their wages aren't keeping up with inflation. The thing that I, I wonder in, about the diamond water paradox that you brought up is if we're hearing a lot about teacher shortages, shouldn't that scarcity make their wages go up? Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but by how much? I mean, there, mm-hmm. there, there might be you know, a drought, but it doesn't mean that every bottle of water is going to be worth a diamond. Yeah. I kind of want to talk about, so you, can you read that quote that you read yeah. again? If budget cuts continue, teaching will cease to be a viable career for educated, engaged, <gasps> ambitious people. Go back to the value, the one where she mentions her She own. says, I do want to be paid what I'm worth. Okay, so yeah, being worth, I think that TK has made some interesting points in the past about personal value versus what you're giving, yeah. you know what I mean? Like you, your salary defining or not defining the value you add. So I don't know if you have any insights into kind of what teachers, the value they bring and, and measuring that. Yeah, you know, I, I think part of what makes this discussion so complicated is we have all sorts of conceptual categories that get conflated. So like being underpaid that's a pretty loaded concept and we have to kind of unpack that i mean what does it mean to be underpaid underpaid there is a sense in which we can say teachers are underpaid just like everyone here we we probably are underpaid in some sense and, and and in that sense it would say are you making enough money to be able to live comfortably or, 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 or be able to provide for your needs within reason, right? Assuming that you're not just aiming for luxury goods all the time. And not having to sell your blood plasma. Yeah, yeah. And, and from the descriptions that I'm reading here, it seems like many of them are underpaid in terms of what they need to be able to take care of their children and so mm-hmm. forth. So there's no debate about that. But there's another aspect of this question, and that is, are you unjustly underpaid? Right. Because it's possible that there may not be enough resources to compensate me for my work. And if that's the case, I'm underpaid. But am I underpaid because someone owes me more than what they're giving me? That's a different thing. So that leads us into the next distinction Mm -hmm. that Anna was getting at, which is between what I call ontological worth or maybe philosophical or spiritual worth, worth that has to do with what something is, with its beingness, versus economic worth, which has everything to do with how much another person is willing to pay you Mm -hmm. for the services you provide. Now, ontologically speaking, Mm -hmm. I think I'm worth a whole lot, right? (laughs) Uh, And and I don't know if I can be paid uh, enough to to account for that because I'm priceless. A human being is priceless. (laughs) Ontologically speaking, I think music is perhaps more valuable than diamonds, right? Uh, Ontologically speaking, I think water is more important than diamonds. Diamonds are dispensable to me. Waters are necessary for human life. Uh, But that's different when I'm trying to get another human being to give me their money. When I want another human being to give me their money and I want them to do it voluntarily, well, now I have to think about the value of what I'm doing, not just in terms of how much I think the world needs it, but how much of a priority it is to this person who has the money that I want. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the way we think about paying educators is negatively influenced by education itself because we don't really teach people about value creation. We don't teach them what money is. We don't teach them what markets work. And so when people graduate school, there's this kind of vague sense that they ought to receive a salary because of what they think they're worth, because of what their degree is, and they don't really have a concept of the relationship between how much my problems matter to you, how much my problems- What value you're adding and how how many resources are out there to give me for the value I'm adding. I think the the value for value point that you're making really helps to uh, kind of set aside the another distinction that people make they say well isn't it ridiculous that uh, basketball players make like celebrity mm-hmm. basketball players make so much more than teachers mm-hmm. when uh, again what what the basketball player is offering is just such it's a frippery yeah. mm-hmm. whereas what teachers Ooh, are that's offering that's a yeah, word uh, <laughs> a frippery <laughs> are, are, later. are so essential but again when you remember that it's value for value you have to think about how many people how many individuals uh, are being provided with value. So like LeBron James, you know, he is providing just just leisure, but to how many people? 
right? Like, like a little bit of value to millions and millions of people, that mm -hmm. adds up to a lot of value being provided. And, and so he's being compensated accordingly, mm -hmm. as opposed to like, okay, maybe it is a lot of value that teachers are providing, but only to like 30 people, human beings at a time. But I think the argument is, or I think that people perceive it, people that really, I mean, do advocate for this, and it is important, is, is they're saying that people, everyone, education affects everyone. Because sure. you, when you educate the future generation, you improve mm -hmm. society. Right. LeBron so James should, isn't yeah, improving isn't, society exactly. by ducking the basketball, right? So we really should pay. We should all be paying more for that good, but, right? But, but so is food. Yeah. And, and so is babysitting. Uh, you know, all these things are, are like really essential in the aggregate and in the abstract. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean that every single food provider needs to be paid like a doctor or a basketball player. Mm -hmm. You know what's also interesting mm -hmm. about this is I think, Dan, you're keen on sort of looking at the alternatives to this public schooling side of thing. And I think it's also interesting, and I don't believe it's captured in that Time Magazine piece, uh, the alternatives that people have to public schooling today and typically what alternatives can do to the price of something, right? So if you have a substitute good, say for example, mm -hmm. uh, homeschool co-op or uh, YouTube video series or Udemy or Khan Academy or whatever, typically what would happen is that those would come onto the market and you know we all like things done cheaper, faster, better, right? Yeah. So that would mm -hmm. then depress the price of the competing thing. And in our case of public schooling, we're then probably talking about salaries of teachers at schools, but it's a bit different because mm -hmm. it's compulsory and done through taxpayer dollars for mm -hmm. the most part. That's right. Well, you could look at, oh, sorry, go, no, ahead. go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, go. you could look at it kind of like, I mean, so public education, you can in theory look at it like a subsidy. We are subsidizing education. Um, what does that do to the price of, of a teacher's salary, to the price of a teacher? What does mm -hmm. it do? If you think about how a subsidy affects prices, mm. I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. Well, I was just going to comment to the idea about like online education. Um, so you, it, if you have like the star basketball player equivalent of a teacher who is providing millions of people with educational lessons, then you would expect that person to be paid like a rock star. Sure. And so, so it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that like education is, is valued less than, than leisure. So, so th th this might actually be a case for more free market um, based education. So the thing about the basketball player versus the teacher comparison is that it really helps us see the difference between stated and revealed preference, right? Because if you take a survey mm -hmm. and you ask most people, what's more important, LeBron James dunking a basketball mm -hmm. or a teacher instructing little children on how to do math? Everyone's going to give the right answer because mm -hmm. we've been through school and we sure. know a test when we see it. We know how to give the right <laughs> answer on a test. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at what we actually do, when scarcity and sacrifice is involved, when we have to decide at the individual level how we're gonna spend our own time and money, we choose watching LeBron James mm -hmm. over the teacher doing what the teacher does. And so we can get angry at that all we want. We, 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 can, we can get really upset, but only by trying to understand that can we actually do something about the problem. The reality of the situation is that in spite of the small number of people who say this is what everyone ought to do with their money, mm -hmm. the majority of people are telling you right now by what they do, what they would prefer to do with their money. And that's pay to watch NBA players, pay to watch baseball players. And so you can't have a debate about how we're gonna pay these teachers without understanding the people that have the resources with which to pay them mm -hmm. and, and what they value. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. And watching the behavior, like you're saying, is what you mean by reveal preferences, not yeah. just surveying, mm -hmm. not just asking, but actually seeing what people choose to do with their money or their time or their energy, whatever. So I do wanna go back to a little bit of what we were talking about at the top, which was these cases, these very interesting and in many cases sad stories of people yeah. who are forced mm -hmm. to sell blood plasma or work a third or fourth job. Um, that brings up the question outside of I think a little bit of what we've been discussing about how the market determines prices and how subsidies can affect prices. Um, to what degree do some of these people have the responsibility to look at their own situation mm and say, well, maybe teaching for all of its nobility, for all of its value that it brings to them individually and to the people who they teach, how much is teaching maybe not the right job for them? And how much should they actually take on themselves for the situation that they find themselves? 
Yeah, so you know, that's a really interesting question for me because I work with a lot of people that are college opt-outs. You know, I have a, I'm an apprenticeship program that helps people launch their careers without a traditional credential. And when people choose to take that path, whether it's through Praxis or through coding boot camps or places like the Lambda School, they tend to get a drill. They tend <laughs> to get drilled by adults who whip out income mm -hmm. statistics and say, well, I, I know that you want to start your own business. I know you want to go to a trade school and all of that. But people who get bachelor's degrees, on average, tend to make this much more over the course of a lifetime. And that ought to be something you consider. And my rebuttal to that has always been, fair enough. It's always good to let people know the income implications of their educational choices. Mm -hmm. But can we do that to more than just college opt-outs? Mm -hmm. I think we all have a responsibility to challenge one another to think critically about our educational choices and what we know about those choices ahead of time. And unlike any other discipline, education is the one subject that we're always having this conversation about. Notice that we don't sit around and have debates about our plumbers making enough. We don't have debates about our you know, garbage truck drivers making enough. We always come back to the teachers because this is one field that has a reputation for not paying well enough. And so I think we do need to challenge people that want to go into education, not to feel guilty about any of this stuff, but to think deeply about, do you feel called to do it? In the same way that if someone says, I wanna be an actor, great, I support your dream, but do understand, this is very different <laughs> from going into accounting. You're gonna to have to face some financial realities that will be tough. Are you up for that challenge? You know, um, And I think we need to do that to people that wanna go into education more. That would be good for education and good for them individually. Absolutely. Yeah, I went, I moved from accounting um, over to the nonprofit sector here at the foundation. Okay. And it is, it is a choice that I had to think for a very long time about. And it is a reality of a choice that you make. And I remember being grilled by my father, being, I mean, all my friends. Um, and it is a decision you have to make and talk about talking about how an experience or a profession can give you value aside from what the salary looks like, yeah. And I think another important distinction that has to be made is that education and schooling are not the same thing. Good point. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Because people, and, and that, that's why when we, you say that you're against public funding of, of education, that then people think that, oh, well, then you're against education. Uh, but often you can question whether what, what it's, some of what's happening in schools is even a service to begin with, or is it a disservice? Um, especially that a lot of people, uh, young people, are, are traumatized by their school experience and, um, and, and actually have the, the love for learning uh, crushed by their, their school experience. So, so you, you can't assume that what they are providing is of that value to begin with. Yeah, it's almost as if we assume that simply because these people are in teaching professions and they are called educators, that they must be providing something valuable as a service, right? That they must be delivering a curriculum or a course or in information uh, valuably, right? But the problem is, just given the incentives and the structures that we've built up around public schooling, um, that we pay bad teachers the same amount that we pay good teachers. Mm -hmm. And there's no real differentiation in uh, sort of uh, the pay scale because the unions have gotten so deeply embedded in how to negotiate mm -hmm. these things. And so that's another dimension to all of this that you know we need to discuss when it comes to the value that we're actually getting from a $59,000 average nationwide salary for K to 12 people. Yeah, so I did find something out kind of interesting to put this in somewhat of an international context. And actually I wanna question, mm. question you all to guess uh, how the United States ranks against other countries as far as teacher pay goes. Any guesses? Oh, like on average? Like who, are we in the bottom? Are we in the middle? Are we in the top? What do you think? Mm. Top any, quartile. Any guesses? Top 25 percent. Yeah, I'll lean on the word quartile as well. Top quartile. <laughs> I'll go with that one. That, that sounds sufficiently yeah. intelligent. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say the middle. Middle? Yeah. Stand, I'll say bottom guess. just because Just for fun. I was surprised to find out that elementary school teachers in the United States are in the top five in the world. Okay. Top five percent. Top not percent, just the top, so the top five countries for uh -huh. teacher pay for elementary school teachers is number one, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Korea, Germany, and then the United States. And then oh. for um, high school, it's, um, excuse me, that was high school. 
and um, we're still in the top five for elementary school as well. Yeah, I wonder if the, those of numbers... Of pay. You're saying like of the, pay, uh, pay right? the best in relation to... So, yeah, we can complain all day that teachers in America aren't getting paid adequately, but we're above Austria, we're above Canada, Ireland, Japan, Portugal. We do really well. And think about how that contradicts this whole when as budget cuts continue conversation. Yeah. So you've got that on one hand. And on the other hand, you've got the notion that we're underperforming in those international mm-hmm. stats. Yeah. Every time we talk about teacher pay, we talk about the fact that yeah. the United States is lagging and yeah. falling further mm-hmm. behind internationally. Yeah. All right. I have, I have a request. Oh, oh. you go first. <laughs> I, I, I might change the, the direction of the conversation. So I oh, I just wanted to take a quick case study. Um, yeah. uh, I mean, so in Atlanta, we have this amazing school called the Ron Clark Academy. And I find it really fascinating because it, it has a lot of these ideas play out. It's a nonprofit, but it's completely privately funded by donors. Um, but it was founded by Ron Clark, who this is where, to me, innovation is so key. So if you are called to educate and you really care about how students learn, Ron Clark created his own curriculum. Hmm and then created a school around it and got mm-hmm. people who like like we say if you value education you should put your money where where your mouth is kind Definitely. of thing and so he you know he's had such a, a supportive um donor base that has created this school that now is is i mean so many has, has received so many awards is so recognized as it's incredibly different than public education but is totally free for its students so it is for essentially it's it's for students who they apply and they get in it's kind of like a private school but it's completely free for the students and i just think that that is all of these things that we really care about which is innovation so you create a better curriculum mm-hmm. how can we really educate students and they how can we make them incredible students um and then it's also got you know if you really do it, it's market support of this idea yeah. which i think is also really cool yeah. um um, so Ron Clark actually, you know, saw a problem. He didn't choose to be engaged in the political side mm-hmm. of trying to solve it, which is a whole big mess and takes a long time. Mm-hmm. And we all have competing interests. He ended up doing this, which is amazing. So TK, and, you yeah. were going to say something else here that uh, hopefully will bring us home and, and end the whole podcast today. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I want to talk for a minute about how we can encourage teachers to be more wealthy, how we can mm-hmm. show them how to be more wealthy. Because I'm, I'm not one of those people who believes that people should just be happy with whatever they make. I'm not one of those people who believes that money is e- evil or that wealthy, wealth is bad. I believe it's a good thing. And if you want more of it than what you have, we ought to support Go that quest, it. right? <laughs> um, and so I don't want to send out a signal, and I don't think we are, but I want to make this explicit, that we're not saying to teachers, hey, uh, we're in the top five. You should shut up and be happy with Absolutely whatever not. you make. No, let, let's figure out how to maximize your, your income potential. And here's one thing I want to point out. I think to make a complaint about being underpaid is to make a complaint about who is actually doing the paying, right? So let's say I think I deserve $1 million to appear on FeeCast, wink, wink, right? Um, (laughs) And I'm not making that. And I say, well, I'm not getting paid enough to make appearances on FeeCast. Well, I'm not just making a complaint about the amount I make. I'm making a complaint about the specific organization that asked me to be on here. And so... If I'm not receiving value from the system or the entity that's paying me, then that means I can negotiate with that entity, I can argue with them, or I can opt out and try to figure out a way to get more value from another entity. And so we, we focused most of our conversation around the value that teachers to, to teachers create, but I also think there's room to talk about the the people for whom we create that value and how willing they are to compensate us. So let's say I sing and I want to get paid to sing. And I sing for one person and they say, okay, that's a decent song. I'll pay you a, do- a dollar to sing to me every day. Well, I'm going to feel like an underpaid musician and I can argue with that person and get angry at them. But what if I can find someone that says, well, I value your singing a little more than that person and I'll pay you $10 to sing me a song every day. Well, now I'm moving in a positive direction. How does this relate to education? I think it's a total myth that the world values education more than it values basketball or other things because the world shows us over and over again that they, they are willing to pay top dollar for education when we educate them about things they care about and when we don't force them to pay the teacher, right? So an example of this would be you take Tony Robbins seminars. I don't care if you like Tony Robbins or not. Doesn't matter to me at all. But I know that people pay thousands of dollars to go listen to Tony Robbins for just a weekend, even though they know they're gonna go home and their life isn't gonna be changed anyway, because he's educating them about things they care about. So I think what there's room to do is to educate educators about how to be more entrepreneurial in what they do and how to not depend on a system 
that clearly doesn't value them enough. Because when you say I'm underpaid, you're not talking about me. You're not talking about anyone at this table. You're talking about a very specific system that has a very specific way of procuring resources and a very specific way of paying you. And if that system doesn't respect you or value you like you wanna be valued, why not entertain the idea of opting out of that system right. and going to deliver your goods to people that actually respect what you know? Mm. Well put. And with that, I think we might have to offer a dollar for you to sing us out. <laughs> <laughs> I'll wait for requests? $10. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Thank you, TK. Thank you, Marianne, Dan, and AJ. And we'll see you next week on the FeeCast. Mm-hmm.